Exalted is a game with billions of charms. There are charms for everything, from fighting to talking to cooking to playing with puppets. Yet, for a creative nerd like me, and probably you since you clicked on this video, this isn't enough. We always find new niches that haven't been filled. We need more. And if the books aren't going to give us what we need, we might as well write it ourselves. If you're new to Exalted, let me explain what charms are. In Exalted you play a god chosen hero with superpowers called charms. They let you do cool things like jumping over buildings, controlling the elements, shaping reality itself. If you're going to do cool stuff like that, there needs to be rules that handle it. You need to figure out what you want the charm to do, how that should interact with the rules, and what to keep in mind to avoid breaking the game. Or to break the game if you want to do that, I don't judge. That's what this video is about. I'll explain the basics of charm design, the different types of charms, and the best practices to make them balanced and fun. A year ago I held a poll about what kind of custom exigent I should make. I never got around to making one, but I thought that I could use that poll as inspiration to design some new charms based on the information from this video. There were two exigents that tied for first place. An exigent of hopeless causes, underdogs and impossible odds, and an exigent of innovation, clockwork, creativity and function. Let's go with the first one. I'll use it as examples for charm design choices and go through my thought process along the way. You might be thinking, who is this guy and why should I listen to him? Well, I'm fairly decent at writing charms. I've done so for years. I recommend getting the Exigent book. It has a full chapter on charm design, which is also the main source of information behind this video if you want to dive deeper. I will break down many of those concepts in a way that's hopefully a bit more digestible, with some of my own thoughts sprinkled in. By the end of the video, you should have all the tools and knowledge you need to create your own charms for Exalted 3rd Edition. Exalted is a game where you can do awesome things with a lot of awesome powers, but how do you make sure that your own charms are awesome enough, but not too awesome? That's a tough question. There is no magic formula to make the perfect charm. You will have to trust your instinct. But that doesn't mean you can't use some helpful tips. The most important thing is that the charm is fun to use. Fun for you and fun for your players. If everyone has a great time using or seeing your charm, then who cares if it's a bit stronger or weaker than other charms? But if you want to be more precise, you should also think about the power level of You should also think about the power level of your exile type. Are you making a charm for a celestial or a terrestrial? How does it stack up to other charms of that same level? Find the charm that does something close to what you want to do, and then use that as a guide. You don't have to copy it exactly, just tweak it to fit your needs. And then do it again and again and again. The more you do it, the more you learn about existing charms, and the easier it will be to find or create the ones you want. Your goal at this point shouldn't be to make a charm that is a copy of an existing charm. That's boring. You want to make something new and original. Something that reflects your character and your theme. Something that impresses your friends and makes them think you're cool. Instead of simply taking a solar charm and giving it a new name, try to come up with a concept that reflects who your character is. Concept first, then figure out how to make that work. How much work you need to do depends on the scale of your project. Are you making a single charm, a whole charm tree, or a whole new Excel type? You might have to make a lot of charms, but you have to start somewhere. And using an existing charm as a base can help you with that. Let's use what we know to start brainstorming a charm for the exigent of hopeless causes, underdogs, and impossible odds. Well, first I should probably come up with a better name for it. Let's go with the Shows No Gloom. I imagine that the Shows No Gloom has powers that can either improve or worsen situations, buff or nerf characters, and make yourself stronger or opponents weaker when the situation looks grim for you or them. A basic starting charm could be something that boosts your attacks when you're fighting someone in a desperate situation. You're feeding upon their desperation, using it to become even stronger. To make that charm, we should look for something that boosts attacks. We also need to decide if we want the Shows No Gloom to be celestial or terrestrial on the power scale. Let's go with terrestrial for now. The Dragonblooded Charm Pounding Surf style lets them add the opponent's onslaught penalty to the overwhelming value of a withering attack. In Water Aura, the bonus also adds to the attack's raw damage. Let's use this as a basis for a simple attack charm for the Shows No Gloom. I know what you're thinking, I said that I wasn't supposed to copy an existing charm. Well, that's true, and the first iteration of this charm will be very similar to the original one. I'm doing this as a teaching moment, and I'm going to elaborate on evolving a charm design step by step throughout the video, so this is a good place to start. 
We want to use our opponent's weakness against them, because that's the shows no gloom way of dealing with a problem. Pounding Seraph style adds the opponent's onslaught penalty to the overwhelming value of withering attack. That sounds fitting for the shows no gloom, right? But we can't use Water Aura, because that's for Dragon Blooded only. We need something else that fits our theme. How about this? If the target is outnumbered, we also add the bonus to the attack's raw damage. That way, we really take advantage of the idea that we want to punish someone for being in a bad spot. Let's write it down using Pounding Surf style as a template by changing a few things. First, we get rid of the Dragon Blooded keywords, because we're not Dragon Blooded. More on keywords later. Second, we replace the Water Aura condition with Outnumber condition. It doesn't have to be exactly the same as long as it's fun and makes sense. Third, we make the charm attribute based instead of ability based. That way we can use it with any kind of weapon or attack, not just brawl. That makes it more versatile and maybe a bit stronger, but that's fine. I have now used the Dragon Blooded Charm as a template for the game mechanics, then made adjustments to fit the Gloom theme. This could be my first chosen Gloom Charm, Cornering Strike. And I can now make more charms that expand upon it. We're not really done with this one yet though, there are some issues with it that we need to address, but to address these issues, we need to understand the charm better. And to do that, we need to learn about dice. There are charms that add dice to your action, like the Excellency charms. An Excellence lets you pay modes to get more dice or successes. Some can even work a little differently, like for the sneaky Siderials you can lower the number they need to roll to get a success. Attribute based Excellences can even let you spend modes to boost your soak or damage. But there's a catch. You can't just add as many dice as you want. You have a limit, and that limit depends on what kind of exalt you are. If you're a Celestial, you can usually go up to 10 dice, but even a Celestial might have to settle for less, like the Siderials, who have other ways to make up for it. If you're a Terrestrial, you usually have a limit of 5 dice, but you might get more if it suits your theme. Dragonblood can go up to 6 dice if they have a specialty. If you want to create the show Snow Gloom, a Terrestrial version could be limited to 5 dice, and maybe get a few more if they are in a really bad situation. You need to be clear about what that means, like being alone against a stronger enemy or having been the cause of a great narrative complication. Maybe they could even get up to 10 dice in such a situation. Non-charm dice are extra dice that you get to make your roll better, but they don't count towards your limit. You can get them from things like equipment or stunts. Effects that give non-charm dice should be either harder to get than those that give normal dice, or they should have some drawbacks. A good rule to follow is to give less non-charm dice for systems that are more complex and where balance matters more. For example, you can usually get more non-charm dice for social charms than combat charms, and even more for project charms. If you want a rule to follow, be more careful when you're rolling against someone else than when you're not. If you want to be a master of charm design, you need to know how dice work in Exalted. On average, a single die will be a success about 40% of the time. But because of the double tens rule, the value of die is closer to 50%. That means, when you roll a bunch of dice, you can expect to get half as many successes as the number of dice you roll. That's easy to remember, right? It makes it simple to understand what it means to spend modes on an excellency to get more dice. For every two modes you spend, you can guess the value of a single success. This is also why it costs two modes to get static values, like higher defense. Now, let's look at all the different ways to change this average. This is where it gets tricky. Some charms could let you double another number than tens, like nines, eights, or sevens. For each doubled number, the value of each die goes up by 10%. That means that the double nines, when both nines and tens count as two successes, each die is worth 60%. This goes up to 70% to double eights, and 80% to double sevens. If a roll doesn't have the double tens rule, like a decisive damage roll, the value of each die goes down by 10% instead. We're back to the original 40% value. Some charms let you re-roll dice, but not all re-rolls are the same. Some let you re-roll a fixed number of failed dice, while others let you re-roll as many dice as you have a certain number, like a 1. That sounds like a small boost, right? Well, kind of. You might get lucky and re-roll the same dice more than once, which makes it a bit better, but let's not get too excited. Let's just say it's a 5% boost to the value of a die. If you do the math, it seems like re-rolling a fixed number of failed dice should be better than re-rolling all possible ones, right? Even if you have a lot of dice. Well, yes and no. It's more complicated than that. 
Let's say you have a charm that lets you reroll all ones until they fail to appear. That should give you about a 5% boost per die. It's only half as good of a boost as rolling double nines, right? There's more to it than that. By rerolling ones, you also avoid some nasty stuff that your enemies might do to you. There are charms that mess with ones rolled by your opponent, and there is a risk that you end up on the receiving end of such a charm. That means that getting rid of your ones is more valuable than getting rid of your twos or threes or fours and so on. This is something you can't measure with just a percentage. The game only lets celestials reroll ones, and they're usually the only ones who get to reroll all of a certain number. Terrestrials often have to settle for rerolling a fixed number that must also meet a certain value, like threes and fours. Even if you only get to reroll all of your ones but nothing else, it can be better than rerolling, say, higher of essence or three of your threes and fours. Some charms are even more generous and lets you roll twice and pick the best result. That doesn't add a set amount to each die, but it makes the whole roll better, especially if you have a lot of dice. For example, if you have 5 dice, rolling twice gives you about 80% more successes. But if you have 10 dice, it gives you about 120% more successes. And if you have 20 dice, it gives you about 170% more successes. That's very powerful, but also very rare. It's more common in very specific situations where getting a lot of successes won't ruin the game, like for crafting projects. Then we have the sneaky sidereal jerks and their target number tricks. These charms change the number you need to roll to get a success, making each die worth about 10% more per point that you lower the target number, or less per point that you raise it. So if you lower the target number from 7 to 6, each die is worth 10% more. But you can't lower it below 4, and you can't raise it above 9. When the charm inflicts a penalty to your opponent's roll, each penalty has about the same value as adding a die to your own roll. This goes for static values too. If you lower an opponent's defense by one, it's like adding a success to your own roll. And speaking of successes, some charms give automatic ones. These are also powerful, but they don't synergize with dice tricks. You can't re-roll them or double them. When making your own charms, think of them as worth two dice. Now that we know all this stuff about dice, let's look at cornering strike again. The charm doesn't do much unless the target has onslaught penalties, and the more penalties they have, the bigger bonus you get. This makes it hard to say how much the charm is worth in modes. You could say it's worth less because it only works sometimes. If the target has no onslaught penalties, you can't use the charm. But if they have a lot of penalties, you get a big bonus. And how much is that worth in modes? I'll talk more about modes and other costs later. I should also think about how onslaught penalties work. A target gets an onslaught penalty for each attack they take in a round. If you're fighting someone by yourself, it will be tough to both give them an onslaught penalty and use it. One way to do it easily is to gang up on them, but then the bonus always works, so maybe that's too easy. Another thing about this charm is that overwhelming is better if you don't do much roll damage, because it sets a minimum value. The outnumbered bonus makes your roll damage higher, so you don't need overwhelming as much. It seems like the charm is fighting itself, but also makes sure that it will help you no matter what, as long as the target has those penalties. Also, since I made the charm attribute based instead of ability based, I made the raw damage bonus less valuable. That's a cool bonus for an ability based exalt who can't boost the raw damage with an excellency, but an attribute based exalt can do that so they don't need a charm to do it for them. So, should I change the bonus to something else? I think I should, both because it's easy for an exalt with a strength excellency to get raw damage, and also to make the charm different from the dragonblooded one. I decided that instead of having the outnumbered bonus add the onslaught bonus to raw damage, it will add a single success to the attack roll. That's like adding two dice as a bonus, but it also works even if the target has no onslaught penalties, which makes the charm more useful. This could have made the charm cost more moats, like 3 instead of 2, but I think the basic effect and the condition are situational enough to keep the 2 moat cost. So that's what I'm going for for now. Now that we know more about dice and their value, we can see this charm in a new light. We understand much more of what's going on. This will help us decide how much it should cost in moats. It will also help us check if our effects and bonuses are reasonable. We'll keep working on this charm later in the video as we learn more about charm design. If we want to be smart, we can use what we learn to make more charms that work well with this one, make it more powerful. For example, what if we make a charm that lets us keep the target's onslaught penalties for another round? 
How would that affect this charm? Now we're getting into the fun part of building charm sets. So far we have talked about how you can use existing charms as templates for new ones. Now we're going to talk about how to structure entire sets of charms. So what makes a charm set good? Themes. Themes that make your charms fit together and tell a story. But how do you pick a theme? First you need to decide if the charms should be based on ability attribute or essence. For my own show Snow Gloom I decided to change a brawl charm into a strength charm, I took an ability charm and turned it into an attribute charm. If I wanted to make an ability based charm set instead, it would have been smart to pick a few abilities because there are 25 of them and that's quite a lot to work with. The Exigent book recommends taking 5 abilities for an ability based Exigent and then make them more flexible to match different themes. That being said, you can do charms for all 25 abilities if you want to, but the charms should then be more narrowly tied to each individual ability. Attribute based charms are vaguer than ability based charms. If you want to make an attribute based exalt, it's recommended to start with a few attributes, maybe 3 instead of 9. Then you can break down each attribute into smaller themes. For example, the shows no gloom strength charms could have themes like desperation, devastation and submission. Desperation charms could be effects that channel your own negative emotions into power. Devastation charms could be effects that cause overwhelming damage. And submission charms could be effects that rely on taking advantage of a weakened state to break someone, whether it is your own weak state or an opponent's. All of this could fall under strength. I would put cornering strike under submission charms if I follow these examples. It would likely be the first charm in the charm tree within submission charms. Follow-up charms would either interact with cornering strike directly or with similar combat scenarios. One example is the charm I mentioned before about giving you an option to prevent the opponent from resetting their onslaught penalties. Another example could be a charm that uses one of the opponent's negative intimacies as a substitute for the outnumbered condition. They might feel alone rather than be alone, but to you, they are still alone. We'll explore more of this stuff later. There are also essence-based charm sets where the powers don't fit in one ability or attribute. The Puppeteer is a good example of this, because the charm effects are more esoteric. I helped write the Puppeteer, and I remember thinking of different themes that I wanted to use before I wrote the first charm. The initial themes that I thought of were doll making, general puppetry, object puppetry, marionettes, self puppetry, shadow puppetry and stage puppetry. Of the feedback from the developers, I changed them to general puppetry, combat puppetry, doll making, marionettes, self puppetry and string weaving. These were changed even more later by the developers, and the final version was different. For example, string weaving became lair charms. So coming up with new concepts for charms doesn't have to be perfect the first time, but making the initial themes helped me visualize new ones. These themes could then be improved and elaborated upon in the second draft, and this could help improve the story behind the character as well. Then it's all about testing and revising, making it better and cleaner. So, to sum up, ability charms follow a narrower themes linked to one of the 25 abilities and use that ability for their effects. Attribute charms follow a wider range of themes within one of the 9 attributes and use that attribute for their effects. Essence charms follow more esoteric themes that don't have to fit in with one ability or attribute. I personally find it more fun to write essence based charms because they can truly test your creativity. Attribute and essence charms also work in martial arts by default, but this might need to be restricted for terrestrial exiles. We have already gone through the process of creating a charm by tweaking an existing one. When you want to create a charm from scratch, you could say that there are two approaches to go about it. You can start with the idea, top down, or the mechanic, bottom up. Both are good, but they have different pros and cons. If you start with the idea, you think of something cool that you want your charm to do, like turn someone's memory into a puzzle, become weightless, or swap places with a painting. Then you must figure out how to make that work in the game. If I want to turn someone's memory into a puzzle, I have to ask myself some questions. Who can I use it on? How do I use it? What does it do? Does it make the memory go away and leave a piece behind, like a puzzle piece? What do I do with this puzzle piece and can I get more? By asking questions like this, I can break down the idea into components. Puzzle pieces, if you will. Then I translate those components into game mechanics. If you start with a mechanic, you think of what you want your charm to do in the game, like attack someone with high soak, read someone's intentions, or, as I mentioned before, prevent someone's onslaught penalties from being reset on their turn. When you know what the charm should do mechanically, you have to give it some flavor and explain how it fits your theme. 
when you do what I did and tweaked an existing charm, that would be considered creating a charm the mechanics first way, bottom up. When trying to come up with effects for charms, consider the following groups. Enhancement effects, enabler effects, upgrade effects, utility belt effects, and narrative effects. Enhancement effects are things that make you better at what you do, like giving you more dice or other bonuses or changing how you do something. They're usually supplemental if they support a roll or reflexive if they support a static value. I'll explain more about what supplemental or reflexive mean later. My own cornering strike is an example of an enhancement effect. Enabler effects are the ones that let you do awesome stuff that you normally can't, like turning a memory into a puzzle. They're often simple or reflexive, but can also be permanent in some cases. Upgrade effects are the ones that make your charms better or give you a permanent boost. They can either improve a charm you already have or give you a new permanent power-up, like more health levels. Utility belt effects are the ones that give you a bunch of small powers in one charm. Some give you all at once, while others let you choose from a list. These can be anything, but they are usually not very impressive or useful by themselves. They are also simpler than normal charms, so you don't have to keep track of as much. They are often permanent, but can also be simpler or flexible with the duration. Finally, narrative effects are the ones that let you change the story in some way, like changing aspects of a scene or determining that something happened retroactively. These types of effects are not as common as the other types. I have already created an enhancement charm for the Chosen of Gloom. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time making complete charms for the other effect types, but let's brainstorm what potential charms could be for the Chosen of Gloom within those other categories. An enabler charm could be something like trapping a person within their own desperation, forcing them to confront the moment in their past where things felt the most hopeless. An upgrade charm could be a permanent bonus that increases your attack rolls when you're in initiative crash, playing on the idea that you draw strength from desperation. A utility belt charm could let you choose between lesser upgrades to allied battle groups based on how many times you purchase the charm, such as treating their size as one higher if the drill is lower than their opponents, or vice versa. And if you repurchase the charm five times, your battle groups get perfect morale. A narrative charm could be something like letting you retroactively instill a stratagem after successfully routing a battle group under your command. Or maybe temporarily giving yourself a new merit, like resources, to counteract a desperate situation. There are plenty of ways to play with the themes for the Chosen of Gloom. Let's go into more detail for a single example, a top-down enabler charm for the Chosen of Gloom. Let's say that I want to make that charm where I trap a person in their own desperation, forcing them to confront their past. Now, how would I do that? I'm not going to make the full charm here, but I'm going to explain my reasoning when going into the bottom-up way of charm design. First, that kind of effect would be suitable as a manipulation charm, since the Chosen of Gloom is attribute-based. It would also be deeper into the tree, possibly an Essence 3 charm. Why Essence 3? I get to that later. Now, I need to translate my idea into mechanics. So, when I say trap someone in their own desperation, what do I mean? This could be something more grounded, like using someone's intimacy against them in social influence, or it could be something weirder, like an actual illusion or a catatonic state. There could also be different levels of these types of effects, with it being translated into a charm tree instead of a single charm. Also, trapping someone. How would they break the effect? How would they become free? If you were the target of this charm, what would make it more fun than insufferable? Here is an example of how it could look like. The Chosen of Gloom rolls manipulation plus performance against the target's resolve, crafting an illusion only visible to the target, depicting his strongest applicable negative intimacy. The target suffers a penalty to all actions and static values based on the intimacy's intensity. Minus 1 for minor, minus 2 for major, and minus 3 for defining. This lasts for a scene, until the target spends 2 willpower, or until he lowers the intimacy's intensity, whichever comes first. This charm can be used once per target per story, unless reset by the target ridding himself of the intimacy. If we really want to make a charm like this work, we need to get a better understanding of charm costs, limitations, types and requirements. We're a bit early for charms of this complexity so far, since we need some context about other aspects of charm design, which I'll get into later in this video. This was more to give an idea of a different mindset of approaching charms from the top down compared to the bottom up. When you use a charm, you must pay for it somehow. The cost also affects how often you can use the charm, depending on the resource used and how fast you can get it back. So how do you decide how much a charm should cost? You can start by counting up dice values, as we did before, or you can compare it to the cost of other charms and make it higher or lower based on different factors. 
For example, if the charm only works in some situations, it should be cheaper than a charm that works all the time. If the charm gives a fixed bonus, it is easier to determine a cost than if it gives a variable bonus, like your integrity in dice. Integrity could be anything from 0 to 5, so how do you pick a cost for that? Start with the lowest value. If you need integrity 3 to learn the charm, the bonus range would be from 3 to 5 and not from 0 to 5. Then you can take the average of these values, which would be 4. But if you learn the charm with integrity 1, the average would be 3 instead of 4. You could also make it cheaper or more expensive based on how common the trait is. Integrity might not be as common as, say, wits, which means that a charm that adds your integrity in dice could be cheaper than one that adds your wits in dice. If we base a variable on something like onslaught penalty, like for cornering strike, it would be harder to determine realistic ranges, and even harder to come up with a reasonable cost. The original charm costs two modes, so we can use that as a reference. If we make it stronger, we make it cost more. If we make it weaker, we make it cost less. What if we don't want to use modes as a cost? What else can we use? What kinds of costs are there anyway? Well, we have the modes, of course. They are the most common cost in Exalted and can be either spent for a quick boost or committed for a lasting effect. When you spend them, they leave your mode pool until you get them back. When you commit them, they stay in whatever you're using them for until you stop. It's first after you stop the commitment that they can be replenished. The best way to know if spending a moat is worth it is by comparing it to an excellency. One moat for an extra die, two moats for a success. Most charms that cost moats follow that rule, and they can then be cheaper or more expensive based on different factors, like if they're terrestrial or celestial, if they have conditional effects, if they are deep into the charm trees. If a charm can be used after all, that alone would be an extra advantage, typically worth four additional moats. You should also be aware that 5 modes are a big deal, especially in combat, for two reasons. First, you get 5 modes back every round in combat, so if you use a 5 mode charm every round, you're breaking even. You could say that once you go over 5 modes per round, you're starting to pay the price. You need to think hard on which charms you want to use and how much you're willing to spend. The second reason is that 5 modes is when your anima starts to glow if you use peripheral modes. Anima is a double-edged sword. It can help you pay some costs and make some effects stronger, but it also tells everyone that you're exalted. Sometimes you don't want to take that chance. Outside of combat, moat costs take longer to get back, but there are also more situations where moat recovery doesn't matter as much. In those cases, moat cost just determines how many effects you can stack on your roll. Another cost that you can use for your charms is willpower. You don't want to use willpower too much because it's hard to get back. Outside of combat, you only get one per day if you sleep well. In combat, you're out of luck unless you have some special charms, if you do a cool stunt, if you uphold a major defining intimacy, or if you achieve major story goals. But most of this is up to the storyteller and not you, so you have more limited control over how you get willpower back. Most charms that cost willpower have it comparable to 4 modes. So a charm that costs 5 modes could in theory be made to cost 1 mode or 1 willpower, but this isn't an exact translation. After all, it's easier to get 5 modes back than 1 willpower in most situations. It's rare for charms to need more than one willpower. It's more common for a powerful charm to have a single willpower to offset some of the mode cost. Initiative could be the most important resource in combat. You need it to make decisive attacks and actually beat your opponent. You also need to keep it from getting too low because if you crash, you're in trouble. Sometimes it goes up and down like a roller coaster, depending on how you manage to land and evade withering attacks. When a charm uses initiative as a cost, it's like one initiative is one mode or one die. It's normal for charms that use initiative as a cost to not work if you're crashed. You need to be tactical with using these charms in a different way than with charms that cost modes. After all, you get 5 modes back every round, but you don't get initiative back unless you take it back. Also, the less initiative you have, the less damage you can inflict. When designing a charm that costs initiative to use, you should consider what the charm is used for. If the charm enhances a decisive attack, giving it an initiative cost would make the damage lower. Most charms that have initiative cost have low cost to avoid messing up the battle flow. Anything above 3 initiative would be huge, since 3 initiative is what you reset to after a decisive attack. Also, charms that are used outside of combat shouldn't have initiative cost at all, since initiative is only relevant in combat. Anima levels are special, because you usually need to spend modes to get them. You could spend 5 modes every round in combat and get 1 level of anima, no problem. But if you really want to go all out, you can spend 15 modes in one go and get 3 levels of anima. You can only have three levels of anima active in Exalted 3rd Edition. Anima costs are mostly for charms that work in combat. For charms that don't, you only use anima costs when it makes sense for the story, like a charm that uses your anima banner for different effects. 
Since you cannot hide an active anima, there is a risk with building it up since it makes you unmistakably exalted. When used as a cost to power a charm effect, each level of anima is only comparable to one mode effect, but it has the added effect that it expends that anima level. If you want to lower your flare, this could be good. If you don't, you probably shouldn't use it. Another cost that you can use for your charms is health levels. This means that using the charm makes you hurt yourself. Just like willpower, health levels are hard to get back once you lose them. The more wounded you are, the longer it takes to heal. Charm costs are based on 5 modes per health level, but that's not all. You also have to deal with the fact that you might get wound penalties from losing health levels. The type of damage you inflict upon yourself is also important to consider, since bashing, lethal and aggravated heal differently. When designing charms that cost health levels, keep in mind how easy or difficult those health levels are for your exalt to heal. Lunars have more charms that do aggravated damage to themselves than bashing and lethal, because their combat time regeneration can't heal it. This makes it more of a trade-off than a charm that would cause bashing or lethal health levels, and the charm effect can be stronger to make up for it. Limit costs are not used a lot, because many players don't like dealing with the Great Curse too often. There are charms that cost limit, but developers have cut down on them since the core book. Limit is also weird because you get it, but don't spend it. So instead of spending a resource to activate the charm, you get something to activate it. Once you get 10 limit, you go into limit break, which is when you become a bit unhinged. When you design charms with limit costs, you have to consider how easy it is for an exile to get rid of it. If they can only clear it by doing legendary social goals, it might be worth as much as willpower. But if they can do it more easily, it should be worth less. Using experience points as a cost for charms is a bad idea, because you might need them to learn new charms and improve your character. You should only use them as charms that give you something awesome and lasting, like a permanent upgrade to a familiar or domain. And even then, most of those charms let you use them for free the first time. If you ever lose the benefit of such charm, like if your familiar dies or you lose your domain, you should get your experience points back. Moats, willpower, initiative, anima, health levels, limit and experience points are the most common costs in published charms. But they are not the only ones. Some of Exalted's systems have their own special resources that can be used to interact with related charms. This happens a lot with craft points, but there are also things like momentum for naval combat. How much these resources are worth change depending on what kind of Exalt you are and how easy it is for you to get them. For example, white craft points are super valuable for Dragon Blooded, because they can only get them from making artifacts, but they can be champ change for some solar crafters. If your exalt has some kind of special resource, figure out its worth by considering how easy it is to get and then compare it to other traits that are similar. Also, since exalted is already a complex game, avoid designing a bunch of unique resources just for your exalt if you can avoid it. Costs are one way to limit how many times you can spam an awesome charm, but there are other limitations as well. Some charms are restricted by how often they can be used regardless of cost, like once per scene or once per story, and if there are some special conditions that can help you get them back sooner. For example, some combat charms are powerful enough to let you utterly devastate an opponent, shrug off attacks like they're nothing, or maybe they are super cheap to use. These charms are usually limited to once per scene, because otherwise you would be too overpowered and the game would be boring. Some charms are even more powerful and can only be used once per day. These are more common for terrestrials than celestials. And then there are the charms that are so epic that they can only be used once per story, like the ones that can create miracles, overthrow tyrants, or alter reality. These charms are most often non-combat or social, and they can give you such a huge advantage that using them more than once would be unfair. There are also charms that can only be used on a specific target once per story, like the ones that cause debilitating conditions, curses, or strip them of their agency. This is also the limitation I added to the example top-down charm effect from before. These restrictions aren't always set in stone. Many of these charms have reset conditions that can be met to use the charm again sooner. These are like mini challenges that you must complete to recharge your powers. Some are easier to complete than others, and some can be extremely complex or depend on luck. Another type of charm limitation are resource thresholds, the idea that you must meet certain criteria to use the charm. This is usually the case with initiative and animal levels, both of which you can generate in combat. Most charms with an anima threshold trigger at bonfire anima, which means that you must first burn at least 15 modes to get it up. As for initiative, there are some numbers that matter more than others. You could get 10 initiative from one really good withering attack. 15 initiative is harder and it takes more work together. 20 initiative is super hard, and it means that you can kill most enemies in one hit. 
That could be the threshold for the most powerful charms that you don't want to be used too often. Some charms require preparatory actions to be completed first, like aiming and shaping sorcery. Don't use these as charm limitations too much, since they can make the charm feel too situational to use. Even if they are powerful, it might be frustrating for players not be able to set them up in time. Too many of these charms are one of the main issues with the Solar Charm set from the core book. We have gotten far already in understanding how charms work, but we need to take a deeper look at the different types. First, we have supplemental charms, the most basic charm type. They are usually enhancements that improve your action in some way, like adding things to your dice rolls or boosting your action in other ways. Cornering Strike is a supplemental charm because it supports a withering attack. Simple charms take up your entire turn, and they come in three flavors. The first one is like an enhancement effect that lasts for a while, like a scene or indefinitely. You still must sacrifice your turn to activate it. The second one is like a special move that you do as part of the charm, like an attack, a speech or something else. You still do a basic action, but the charm determines how the action works. The main difference between a simple charm and a supplemental charm is that a simple charm drives the action, while a supplemental charm supports it. Finally, the third flavor of simple charms defines an action like the second one, but it creates an entirely new type of action, like flying, teleporting, or turning invisible. These charms often have enabler or narrative effects. I would probably make the top-down charm idea from before into a simple charm if I were to write it up. Reflexive charms are the most versatile ones, and they can do all sorts of things, like improving static values, adding benefits after a roll has already been made, or adding something extra to your turn without using it up such as letting you attack or aim reflexively. Some reflexive charms can also activate more lasting effects, like some simple charms, but they can happen instantly instead of taking a turn. In many situations, if your charm idea doesn't seem to work as a simple or supplemental charm, it probably works as a reflexive one. Finally, we have permanent charms. They are the best kinds because they are always on, giving you a permanent effect, like more health levels. Some of them permanently improve other charms as well. There are permanent charms that require a cost to activate. Some of these could probably be written as reflexive charms instead, with the difference mainly being that they often upgrade the character or other charms without being explicitly tied to actions or defenses. All charms have a duration that determines how long their effects last. An instant charm happens immediately. You don't have to commit modes to it because the effect isn't lasting. But the consequences of the action that uses the charm might be. You'll see this duration on most charms that affect a single action, like an attack. If we zoom out a bit from the immediate effect of instant charms, we have charms that last for a tick. A tick is not a creepy little insect that wants to suck your blood. It's the smallest measure of time in an exalted combat scene, with effects that last for more than one action, but not for longer than a turn. This duration is good for charms that affect flurries or defenses. You shouldn't make charms that use longer tick durations though, just use rounds instead. These last until the end of the combat round. If we zoom out even further, we get to the until next turn duration, where the charm effects last until you act again. So while round based effects only last until the round is over, until next turn effects last into the following round until you have had another go. Then we have the scene charms. This is a dramatically appropriate length of time based on the story. It could be an hour of downtime, a tense boss fight, or just a series of connected actions. Basically, it's how long the drama lasts. The charm effects last for the whole duration and end when the scene is over. This is the most common power-up charm like a martial arts form. If a charm lasts even longer than this, it could be indefinite. That means that the charm effects last for as long as you want them to, but you have to commit some modes for it. You can uncommit the modes whenever you want to end effects. Some charms have durations measured in days. This isn't strictly 24 hours. The duration measures the expected waking hours of a day, whether the sun or the moon is up. Moats are committed for these charms too, but unlike indefinite charms, you must renew these the following day if you want to keep them going. I have already talked about permanent charms, but many of them lost permanently. Once you get effects, you can't turn them off. There are also charms with other types of durations, such as project long durations. These are common for crafting, training, and bureaucracy charms. These can tie up your moats for a long time, since you need to commit the moats for the entire project. Another aspect of charm design are keywords. I'm going to go through all primer ones here. There are four keywords that tell you what kind of attacks you can use your charms with, and what kind of attacks you can defend against with your charms. They are uniform, dual, decisive only, and withering only. Uniform charms are the easiest ones, as they can be used with both withering and decisive attacks, and they do the same thing no matter what. Dual charms are a bit trickier. You can use them both with withering and decisive attacks too, 
but they do something different or something extra depending on which one you choose. Decisive only charms are the ones that only work with decisive attacks, and withering only charms are the ones that only work with withering attacks. The first charm we did in this video, Cornering Strike, was withering only because it gave bonuses to overwhelming. Let's do the rest of the keywords in alphabetical order. I'm then going to talk briefly about Exalt specific keywords and use keywords to expand upon the chosen of gloom. Aggravated is used for charms that can hurt your enemy really bad by inflicting aggravated damage. It's primarily as the label and it's no big deal if you forget to include it. Bridge charms have charms from different charm trees as prerequisites, like integrity charms that need so or so many war charms. You don't have to use the keyword to do this, but it has some perks that might be useful. For example, if a bridge charm is not in your cast or favored trait, you still get a discount on it. So that integrity charm that bridges off war charms would be cheaper to get if you have war as cast or favored. There is a catch though. You can't use the same charm as a prerequisite to more than one bridge charm. Charm, 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 charm. Clash charms let you clash an enemy when they attack you. Some charms might let you clash with other things than attacks, like when someone likes, comments, or subscribes. You can't use a clash and a counterattack charm at the same time unless some effect states that you can. Also, if a charm lets you attack without using your turn but doesn't have the clash keyword, you can't use it to clash. Neither can you clash against counterattack charms. Speaking of counterattack charms, they let you get back at your enemy for attacking you. After an enemy has attacked you, but before they roll damage, you can use a charm like this to attack them back. Some charms might let you counterattack at different steps or in different ways, or even in response to different actions. They should clarify this in their descriptions. Eclipse charms are used by non-exalts like spirits, and you can learn the charms from them if you have the eclipse cost anima power. When designing eclipse charms, keep them different from normal exalt charms. You want them to be unique and weird, such as learning how to call down lightning from a storm under. I made a supplement called Ghost on the Storyteller's Vault where there are dozens of Eclipse Charms with different types of ghost powers. Check it out if you're interested. While Eclipse Charms normally need Eclipse Cost Anima Power to learn, you could design charms that give access to certain Eclipse Charms in other ways. The Mute keyword is for charms that let you spend peripheral modes without making your anima glow. It's mostly for charms that help you with sneaking, stealing, lying, and so on. Not all charms like that should have this keyword though. Give it to charms that cost three or more modes so that it's more useful. Perilous charms can't be activated while you're initiative crash. It's a way of making powerful charms riskier and more tactical, and it's always given to charms that cost initiative to use, since you can't spend it when you're at zero blow. Perilous charms with lasting effects don't stop working when you crash, they just can't be activated at the time. Pilot charms have something to do with sailing or ships, and it means that you have to be the captain or helmsman of a ship to use them. It's mostly for flavor, but the main reason for why this exists as a keyword is to make sure that the charm is only used by the one in charge or control of the ship, so that you don't have a bunch of exalt sailors all trying to stir the pot. Psyche charms mess with your target's head. Unlike normal social influence actions, these are more like hacking their brain. It could be effects like changing someone's memories, screwing with their thoughts, or getting them to do things like liking this video and subscribing to my channel. The salient keyword is useless and should be ignored. It only shows up on two solar craft charms and they are both inconsistent in how it's used. The shaping keyword is new to the excellent book and represents magic that changes something about the character, like transforming their body, mind, and soul. There were plenty of shaping charms released long before it became a keyword, but they would have had this keyword if they were released today. The keyword also specifies what is being changed in brackets. Stackable charms can be used more than once, and multiple uses stack their effects. Finally, written only charms work with written influence and not spoken influence. It's most often seen with linguistics charms. If you plan to make an attribute based exalt, you should specify this keyword on charisma and manipulation charms if they are all meant to be used with writing. Exalts often have unique keywords that highlight their special abilities. I've already mentioned the Dragon Blood is Aura keyword. This gives them extra benefits linked to their current elemental alignment. Lunars have the Protein keyword, which rewards them for using charms that match their current shape. Keywords are all about clarity. They are there to help you better understand what a charm is about without having to read it. With more charms than particles in the universe, keywords help you find them easier at a glance. When creating new ones, you want them to simplify and centralize a certain mechanic that is frequently used in the charm set. Aura for the dragon blooded, Protean for lunars, we have Entangled for the puppeteer, Mastery and Terrestrial for martial arts, Resonant and Dissonant for artifacts. If something is repeatedly coming up in your charms, it might be time to consider making it a keyword. So, back to cornering strike. 
I have this outnumbered condition that adds a second trait to the charm. Based on what we know about the Chosen of Gloom's theme so far, we can assume that something akin to the outnumbered condition might repeat itself in their charm set. Since the desperation and hopelessness are central themes in the Chosen of Gloom's charms, it could be a good idea to establish two keywords, one that is active when the Chosen of Gloom dominates another, and one that is active when the Chosen of Gloom is the one being dominated. Let's call this keyword torment and despair. If any of you weirdos use this as a BDSM exalted, it's not my responsibility. An idea could be to have the torment keyword suggest that the charm has special effects that activate when used on a target that is in a desperate or hopeless situation. The despair keyword would be similar, but it would activate when you were the one in that situation. We must clearly define what this means to avoid confusion at the table. My idea is that the torment effect activates when your target is showing clear signs of distress, such as fear, grief or desperation. This does not have to be an emotional display, but must be evident from the target's actions, such as them covering or attempting to retreat. The storyteller is the final arbiter on what constitutes distress. The despair keyword activates when you are in a situation that shows clear signs of distress, confusion and lack of control. Examples include being socially outmaneuvered, being ambushed by a larger force or witnessing a positive tie being harmed. With these new keywords, it would make sense to give cornering strike the torment keyword and changing the outnumbered condition to the torment effect. However, as the torment effect is broader than the outnumbered condition, I think it would make sense to increase the charm's mode cost by one. Let's make a variant of Corning Strike that uses Despair instead of Torment. I need to change the Charm's themes from something that uses the target's weakness against them to something that uses the Exalt's weakness as a strength. Instead of taking advantage of a target's onslaught penalty, we can take advantage of our own wound penalty by adding it as a bonus to Overwhelming. The Despair condition could then be that the Shows No Gloom ignores their own wound penalty on the attack roll. This new charm, Desperate Strike, is similar in function, as it adds to Overwhelming, but has a completely different feel and use. I probably wouldn't add two charms this similar to the final charm set, but it's an example on how we can make use of keywords to better accentuate our character's themes and make it easier to translate those themes into mechanics. We're almost done. I want to talk a bit about minimum requirements as well. As you all should know, charms have requirements in the form of attributes, abilities or essence. The trait value can have an impact on the type of charm it is, and its overall power. Since you start the game at Essence 1 most of the time, Essence 1 charms are available to all. Even though they are accessible to new characters, they can still pack a punch. They can be good for most things. Essence 2 charms don't offer that much of a power-up compared to Essence 1 charms, but they provide more tools and polish to the charm set. It's more about broadening the scope than to vastly increase your power. Now, Essence 3 is where things can get spicy. This should offer more of a power boost, offering effects that take the charm set to new levels. Essence 4 is to Essence 3 what Essence 2 was to Essence 1. It doesn't offer much in the form of a power boost, but instead broadens the scope of what is available. Finally, Essence 5 offers another power boost, introducing powerful and climactic effects, but it shouldn't be as much of a jump as it was from Essence 2 to 3. Most charm sets are designed to have the most interesting stuff at Essence 3 to make it available to the players, as many players won't make it to Essence 5. If Essence minimums determine the power of a charm set, ability minimums focus on how much of a specialization you need to qualify for a certain charm within that power level. This is assuming that the charms are ability-based. Ability 1 charms are your bread and butter the kind of stuff everyone can learn. Ability 2 charms are a bit more advanced, but still offer mostly basic effects. Ability 3 charms are where you start to get fancy. These effects require real investment and can include role-defining capabilities. Ability 4 charms increase the power without adding too much else in the form of specialization. Finally, Ability 5 charms are the mastery effects, the special techniques you learn from true dedication. One way to think of it is that at Ability 1 you learn how to throw basic punches. At Ability 2 you learn to punch things without bruising your knuckles. At Ability 3 you learn some fancy new moves. At Ability 4 you take those moves to a new level. And at Ability 5 you have become a master yourself. But even these ability minimums can be represented a bit differently at different essence levels. Charms that require Ability 1 or 2 are typically limited to Essence 1, with a few rare Ability 2 charms at Essence 3. At Essence 5, almost all charms require Ability 5. There is no set number of charms you need to learn at each level, but it's common practice in charm design to have the least charms at Ability 1 and about half at Ability 5. 
Most charms deeper into the trees will require someone who is a true master of that ability, especially at higher essence levels. Attribute-based charms follow much the same line of thinking as ability-based charms. Attribute 1 charms are available to everyone. Attribute 2 charms are the lowest possible investment, accessible to most. Attribute 3 charms are minor investments, similar to ability 2 or 3. Attribute 4 charms are about the same as ability 3 or 4, making it require more of an investment and not be as readily available. Finally, attribute 5 charms are almost exclusive to high essence charms. Attribute charms are much less likely to have low essence charms that require attribute 5. The line of thinking here is to let players grow their attributes over time instead of trying to maximize them early. There are typically fewer attribute 5 charms in an attribute based charm tree than there are ability 5 charms in an ability based charm tree. The reason for this is because attribute 5 is a bigger investment than ability 5 and most charms are designed to be used. The final thing I'm going to talk about are prerequisites. As you go deeper into the charm trees, you will find more charms that require other charms to access. Think of it like first investing in roots and those roots eventually becoming branches. The roots are basic charms with low requirements, and the branches are advanced charms with high requirements. When designing a charm tree, put the effects that the character should always need early in the trees, and the more specialized and niche effects later in the trees. When it comes to the absolute strongest of charms, you could have several branches culminating in one single mind-blowingly awesome charm, like the ultimate price for a huge investment. Also when designing charm trees, try to make every charm interesting and useful. I think the 3rd edition core book failed at this, with too many charms added as bloat alone. Later books corrected this, and the charm design in later splat books are much better designed in the core book. This is a bit sad for solar, since the charm sets aren't as interesting, but these more straightforward and boring solar charms can instead act as baselines for other charms. This video is long enough as it is, so I'm not going to drag it out with a bunch of extra details or final lessons. Drop a like on the video, start writing some charms, and then comment below with your own. I would like to see people help out and provide feedback on charms if you decide to post them in the comment section, and I'll try to comment on as many as I can as well. Finally, I want to once more encourage you to get the Exigence book if you want to delve deeper into charm design, and check out Ghost on the Storyteller's Vault if you want to see more of my own stuff. I also post stuff every month on Patreon and for YouTube members but that is mostly my own personal projects like Machine Bone. Anyway, until next time. <laughs>